asking big questions. My intent is for us to ask those most important questions in our lives that really challenge us and understand that growing faith is always about big questions. And I would suggest that the faith that is truly growing towards humility and love and grace is more interested in asking questions than telling everybody what to believe. The scripture has enough answers for us and also raises so many questions. Today's big question really gets at the heart of the scripture, how can I find happiness? And the scripture identifies one of the greatest challenges we face is we look everywhere but to God for happiness. And oftentimes our happiness gets ruined when we see somebody else living the way We think they shouldn't, and we worry so much about them, we forget what God might have for us. So today, we're going to ask the question together, how can I find happiness? And actually, I think this is not an easy question to answer. I think when we really get down to it, even though we say that we are a people in pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that the truth is there is so much that can keep us from happiness We can get overwhelmed by everything that life throws at us. And when we are tripped up, when that banana peel is thrown out in our way, it keeps us from looking towards God. So, this morning, let me invite you to join me in asking the question, how can you and I find happiness? First idea is this, everyone is looking for happiness. I believe that's true. There are different ways to describe what happiness is. Joy, relief, satisfaction, elation. But I think all of us are looking for happiness. I actually think it's built into us. If I want to think theologically for a minute, I think God has created all of us from the very first breath we take to seek out a kind of happiness. And I think we can see it at every age. I mean, we can see it in the infant who loves to be happy. Is there anything better than a giggly, laughing baby, especially one that wants to reach out to you and let you hug them? And not only babies, but uh, teenagers. Believe it or not, teenagers want to be happy too. I'm not sure if these are teenagers or college-age students. I have to be really honest with you. You get to a certain age, I've found, and I have no idea how old people are, younger than me or older than me anymore. So, But I think those are teenagers. Believe it or not, teenagers do want to be happy. Younger adults wish to be happy. That younger adult looks like he's my age, so maybe he's not so much younger anymore. (laughs) Well, you know, it's all relative, right, Carrie? Yeah, relative. And then the more experienced adults, they wish to be happy too. At every age, we seek out happiness, and we sometimes, in a very simple dichotomy, Uh, either or kind of way of thinking we say I am either happy or unhappy I was happy now and I'm happy this way you know but it's built into us I just am convinced of this one of the ways that we can clarify classify identify what it means to be human is that there is this desire this dynamic urge to find happiness we're all looking for it I'm not thinking about this so much yet, but could it be we are also wishing to see someone else that we care about happy too? Second idea. The trouble with happiness is that it's difficult to acquire and to maintain, isn't it? I mean, it's difficult. The scripture, in fact, is talking about that, how there are some who are never satisfied, never happy enough. They want to acquire more, gain from others, defeat someone else. They're always striving and craving for greater happiness, never satisfied. I mean, think about how, the li- how life works. I mean, we're always happy when we see, you know, a beautiful apple. But apples don't say beautiful. They turn an ugly color, right? A road, don't you love a really nice, beautiful road? But pretty soon you realize you're driving in Missouri, and oh my gosh. <laughs> no offense to the highway department, by the way. I love what you're doing. You know, um... I think there's another one. I don't have a, oh. <laughs> These are my Kansas City. I grew up in Kansas City, if you don't know this. I, I bleed cardinal red, but when the Royals won the World Series a few years ago, I mean, it had been since I was a kid. 
that they had any kind of team worthwhile. I couldn't believe it. But we know what happens, right? Pretty soon they revert back to the to normal. <laughs> Happiness only lasts so long. Am I got is there one more slide after this? I was trying to remember. I think I revised it. Or is that all we've got? What's next? That's it? Sometimes happiness is fleeting. But it is great. <laughs> when it happens, it is great. You know, one of the challenges with happiness is that it is difficult to get to that point. Because in our mind, we define happiness narrow, narrowly. And once we've got that thing we have been striving for and hoping for, we fail to remember this is a temporary world we live in. There's this scientific notion called entropy, moving from order to disorder. And in some sense, I think it does describe how in our lives we are moving from one place to another. It's not always from happiness to happiness. But there can be then difficulty. It takes away that great happiness we've been striving for. We all search for happiness, but holding on to it, even getting happiness, it's difficult. Third idea. We look for happiness in so many places and expect it to be a constant feeling. We do have this idea that everywhere we look, wherever we live, we should find moments of happiness, right? When your pastor wakes up in the morning, I make sure I find a moment of happiness. <laughs> Mrs. Gillen's over here, and she can testify to the truth that when... Mr. Gillen forgets to buy coffee. I don't, I don't know if, if, we, if we post this online, I don't know if the folks online watching this will be able to hear clearly a, a little baby in the room on cue did exactly what I do when I don't have coffee in the house. That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. But don't we look for happiness in so many places? I mean, uh, coffee is wonderful, delicious food. Don't we love that? I mean, we, we find in food this delicious kind of satisfaction. If you're a chef, if you're a cook like I get to be sometimes, one of the, the great things is to be able to watch someone else or lots of someone else's find tremendous happiness in the work we do. Isn't it great? And if you're like me, it's always wonderful to have a wonderful chef who makes us something wonderful, and then we can make them feel good by eating their delicious food. We're looking in life all the time for mountaintop experiences. We are wishing more and more in our world today to find in every single place, in every relationship, in every job, in every neighborhood, in every church, in every grocery store, other kind of environment we're in, wherever we are, more and more, we are looking for places that make us feel constantly happy. And we go to our doctor. If we can't find that quickly, and we say to our doctor, I can't find happiness. And if you have a doctor like me, he'll look at you and say, eh, <laughs> you're getting older, Mike. No, that's not really helpful, is it? My point is simply this. We do have in us, I believe, a divinely inspired urge to discover happiness and joy in this life. But we can misunderstand how emotions work and how relationships in this world works. And that in the ebb and flow of life, when it's within the normal range, right? And there is a normal range. There can be times when we, we need assistance. That's what the scripture is speaking about. God and then those who are agents of God offer assistance in so many ways. Haven't you found God's grace and someone else's help? I am certain God offers me grace every morning with that first cup of coffee. And I'm only half joking, by the way. But we make a mistake when we think that everywhere we are should be filled with happiness 
And that should be a constant feeling. It leaves us disappointed and frustrated. And we fail to take the lesson from those moments of less happiness, more sadness. We fail to see we're being called to realize we are dependent on the one who offers us eternal life and happiness. Fourth idea is this, that God offers us happiness based on our willingness to sacrifice and to serve. There is a completely different, different definition of happiness in this God-inspired life that we discover in the psalm, and if we look to the New Testament as well, we discover there is a kind of happiness that is dependent upon God, and that as we offer ourselves to God, and are willing to sacrifice for God's causes rather than ours alone, we discover a greater sense of happiness than we ever expected. Happiness is based then upon not what we acquire, but what we offer. If you ask me how does that make any sense, I want you to look at the cross here and the cross way up there, the cross behind me, understand That we have a cross that we're marching to through Lent, moving towards in Holy Week, that calls us to understand how we are meant to, in our minds and in our hearts, reorient ourselves to God's way of life. Looking towards Christ's way, realizing we are created to serve God and others as we follow Christ and are inspired to live in the Holy Spirit. What does it look like to find happiness in God through sacrifice? It can look something like this. Like people who we have supported, some of whom are here today, going to a place literally called Far Texas, spelled P-H-A-R-R, but it is far away, and going to that far away place and helping a Methodist church that is in that town that cannot afford on its own to do so, to build for them from the ground up a significant addition, knowing we will get nothing back directly. We won't get a single dollar from that church ever. Do we care? If you ask anybody who went on that trip, even the ones who sacrificed health, time off, financial resources, They will say to you, to a woman and man, we never wanted anything back from them, and yet they gave us more than we expected. Whether it was delicious tamales, handmade the night before, a chance to speak with someone who may not even have been able to directly understand or be understood by our leadership, our team, because language barriers were involved, or simply the people of the church we served offered us something in exchange. Gratefulness, food, friendship. How do you measure happiness in your life? Are you measuring happiness by a constant feeling you have? Are you measuring it by what you can get from this world? whether it's respect or security, financial gain? What is it you're wanting to get from this world? What if you and I are created essentially not to get from this world, but to give to this world? If that's the case, that is a strange economy in our minds. It is the opposite of the economy we have grown up participating in. The economy of this world wishes for us to acquire as much as possible in order to satisfy as much as possible. And the economy of God is constantly urging us to realize the entirety of our purpose is to serve God with all of who we are to demonstrate our love for God. And then, as Christ gives all to us, we are called to give all to our neighbor. 
what would happen if that's our definition of how to acquire happiness? How can I find happiness? What if the answer is simply willingly sacrifice for God and others through service? You say to me, well, I can't do what I used to do. I'm too old. I've got too many financial obligations. I've got kids who are still in school. I've got grandkids who I have to take care of now. I don't feel as good as I used to. I just got a stint put in my heart, even though it's a small one. We all have excuses for not serving. Plus, we probably have, re- have misdefined what service is. Service does not mean moving to Africa. It can. But just last week, I mentioned to you that there is a reality we need to acknowledge in our context, our world. And the reality is that every one of you that I can see, that I can hear, that I can hold a hand with and, and be hugged by, and I, all of us in this room, have family, friends, neighbors, acquaintances we know by name, who do not go to church and do not have any kind of real substantial relationship with God. That means they don't have a a community of faith, a church family to support them and to be a part of. And they don't have a connection to the only God that is. You don't have to be a Billy Graham-like fiery witness verbally speaking your faith at every turn. Although some of you just can't help yourself. You love to share with others that, that grace you have experienced. Verbally, you love to do it. So many of us in this room, though, can offer God's free grace and unconditional love to those people we know in so many ways especially if we decide we're meant to serve those who aren't with us rather than gain something from them. Last idea. Fifth idea is this. Faith in Christ can become a resource for us when we need help finding happiness. I do think this about Christian faith, that is, it's meant to be understood as, in God's economy, as a resource, the ultimate resource. If we really are truly created to be dependent upon God, then let's depend on God. When we need help, I think one of the biggest questions we face every day is how can I find happiness? Well, then why don't we lean on God and look for God's help? And understand God's help will then lead us into connections with others, into purposeful work. Even something as simple as becoming more involved in a daily effort to pray for the well-being of someone else leads us to a life of service and sacrifice rather than acquisition and acquiring of something else. So this week, as we seek to find a resource in Christ to help us be happy, what can we do? Here's some suggestions today. What can you and I do to find happiness through Christ? First, we begin with prayer. Simply do this. Ask God to help you find happiness. First thing. Now, my challenge to you is, don't also say, God, help me to be happy by helping me too, don't tell God what to do. It's kind of like when someone walks up to you and says, I don't want to tell you how to lead your life, but, and then they've got some ideas for you. (laughs) Have you ever had that happen before? You know, listen, D, I don't want to tell you how to live your life, but I've got a couple suggestions for you. What does D. Stilgenbar do then? Shut off, right? I bet God wants you to tell God how to do God's work, so. no. Why would we do that? We're dependent upon God. Now, I'm preaching to myself. By the way, you just happen to overhear this. This is me talking to me for a minute, but um, sure. Begin with prayer. Ask God to help you find happiness. And then be still before God and listen. Hear what God has to say to you. It's so easy to say, God, I want to be happy, and this is what I'd like to have happen. 
I'd like to receive that grant today. I'd like for this board to agree with me. I'd like for my, uh, my clients to not question the grand designs I have. I'd like to be able to have a plant work this time and not have these people calling me and say that my design's wrong when I know it's right. You know, I want to have my kids stop asking me to take care of them. They're 55 years old, for gosh sakes. <laughs> When you pray to God and say, help me find happiness today, God, then listen and see what's next. Then understand Christian faith is never meant to be lived in solitude and inaction, but it is an active, practical faith. So then reach out to your Christian sisters and brothers and ask them to pray for your happiness. One of the reasons we are called into life together with other people in Christian faith is to support each other. How many times have I done this? Well, it's very rare. So I really am. I mean, I want to be self-sustaining. I did it myself. One of my favorite phrases as a little kid. First day of kindergarten, I ran into my mom's room because I had learned this in preschool. I said, look, the color's coordinated. I don't know if they really were, but I thought they were. Again, we've talked about how I might have problems with colors, which, what are colors, what, what does brown look like, what does black look like, eh, but I thought I did the right thing. Maybe you're like that too, and you don't like to reach out to other people. There are ways to work at this slowly over time, but as we reach out to others, to trusted sisters and brothers in Christ, we discover that in our connections, eternal connections, we find a strength we wouldn't have otherwise. It's okay to say to sisters and brothers, I am so unhappy, I wish I weren't here at this church. I am so unhappy, I wish I didn't have to be alive anymore. I am so unhappy that I would like to have a new family. It's okay to say those things, not too loudly, <laughs> to, especially the last one, <laughs> unless you really want to see if it happens. But to trusted sisters and brothers to express your unhappiness. It's even okay to say to God, God, I am so unhappy with you, God. I think God's big enough to handle our disappointment, our sadness, our anger. And to say to sisters and brothers, I'm angry with what God is letting have happen in my life. But when we ask our sisters and brothers to help us, to lift us up, to walk with us, we are changed. And we'll get a chance to do the same for them. Third, begin searching for ways to serve God and others. As you give, you will receive. Let me start again with the easiest way to get involved in this seven-day week church is to take the prayer concerns and joys we have Take them home with you, and each day spend less than a minute as you begin praying for those folks, praying for those situations. Less than a minute each day. That minute will grow to become more important in your life. But one way to serve God and others is to begin praying for those that are part of this community of faith, those concerns, those joys that are part of us, But that's just the beginning. There will be ways, little ways, and really, really enormous ways for you to be able to serve others. Begin searching for those ways, and you will discover what you've been created to be, a servant to God, a servant to your neighbors, to your sisters, your brothers in Christ, and to those who need to know who God is. Asking big questions, it's crucial to a growing faith in Christ. One of the biggest questions, how can I find happiness, calls us to see as we turn ourselves over to God and lean on God every day and lean into our friendships in Christ, we begin to answer that question and find happiness in ways that are both faithful to God and who we've always been created to be. Will you pray with me? God, today, give us the desire 
the ability to ask you, how can we find happiness? And then help us find those answers as we trust in you. In Christ's name, amen.